Okay, I, I think I don't need a microphone here. Am I loud enough? You understand me? In the, okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Harold. Yeah, I'm from Austria, not Australia. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was a little misunderstanding. Uh, and I'll talk about scaling PHP, PHP web applications to get ready for the peak season. Uh, I need to turn that on, then it's better. Uh, I work at Dynatrace as a technology strategist. My, my background is actually in databases and web development for many, many years. Uh, besides that, I like to do a lot of other things, uh, also uh, going caving down to Mother Earth, uh, exploring. Uh, well, scaling uh, web applications. Uh, I'd like to focus more on background and pre-requirements uh, for scaling rather than giving advices how to scale directly because what I saw in the last years when I worked with projects uh, mainly in terms of performance uh, increasing is people had performance problems and when I asked them, well, do you have any plans already? Uh, the answer that I got most times is, yeah, well, we need to scale our infrastructure, we need more servers, uh, and they expected that everything's run, running faster then. Well, when we looked deep into the system and, and analyzed what's actually happening there, we saw that this was useless because the, the server was, was bored anyway, had nothing to do. So a lot of times it's like that, the online shop was too slow and the expectation, expectation was to scale the infrastructure to increase performance. Uh, a couple of words on performance versus scalability to, to show the difference a little bit here. Well, this is what we think about performance, yeah, power, strength, uh, being fast, being, being strong. A single server, a single individual can be already very performant. On the other hand, this is scalability. So when we have uh, fast systems, fast applications, and we scale them, we get more instances of that, we get very powerful. On the other hand, this is also scalability, right? Uh, but yes, maybe we get less performance out of that. But still, we have a scaled environment. So we have scaling here, but maybe not performance. Uh, does performance matter at all? And uh, we heard uh, a couple of very interesting things with HTTP2 now, where we learned about increasing performance with that. And yes, definitely, performance is relevant. Uh, and performance has become more and more relevant over the years. Back in those days when, we ha when this was the Amazon website, I don't know if any of you guys remember that, uh, performance was more about, uh, yes, uh, the internet is slow, maybe I need a, a faster dial-up connection because this was more or less the real bottleneck back then. Well, times have changed since then. Uh, the environment, the, the entire ecosystem looks different. And especially in the last eight to 10 years, uh, this has changed dramatically. A new digital customer has emerged out there. Uh, mainly mobility, uh, mobile devices, and just the way of how we use the internet. Uh, it used to be online shopping, e-commerce, uh, for many years now, <laughs> the world is changing again. Uh, it's mainly used to find Pokemons, probably. <laughs> uh, but uh, in, um, in the, the millennium generation, the, in the new generation, the, the mobile device adoption is already 95%. And especially here, it's very relevant to have fast connections to have fast applications because 60% say that the most frustrating thing is a slow system 
or a not working system at all. So when we get uh, responses back, uh, sorry, we are not available or whatever. So on the one hand, it's about making the user happy because a happy user is a returning user. A returning user is a converting user, is a user that's, that's buying products in our online system. And this is actually what, what, what we want to achieve in the end. Um, on the other hand, it's not just about making users happy. It's also about making them happy. Because what does performance mean for Google? Search engine optimization is a, a, a very uh, important uh, factor. There is already performance. If you have a slow website, it will be indicated as slow in your, in your Google search results. And up to now, uh, they are considering performance just for, for uh, desktop environments. But Google is planning to extend that to mobile applications as well now. So performance is becoming more and more relevant here. Yeah, and as I said, not only performance, but uh, another frustrating thing for most of people is when we have systems out there that are not available at all. But this is also a thing that we can cover with scalability. A couple of words later on that, uh, later. So scalability is more than just performance. It's about creating a well-sized environment, uh, ensuring high availability to not get, sorry, we're not available screens like before. We already talked about high performance and to handle large number of transactions, high concurrency, a lot of users uh, using our system. But not only in the operational perspective, but also to respond to feature requests. If we have designed our system well, we can respond much faster to new features and find and fix problems much faster. But in a large environment where we have probably not only PHP running, but other technologies, Java.net, whatever there is out there as well, databases, we have web servers, load balancers, even browsers are becoming more and more relevant because more and more code is running in the browser. We have the, these single page apps that just fetch code from the, from the web server. So where should we start here? Or w what's the main, the most important tier where we need to do our scaling. Well, we are mainly here to talk about PHP. So the bad news here is if we have different technologies, PHP is definitely slower than Java. Uh, PHP is becoming much faster uh, with PHP 7 now. But still, for instance, Java would be a faster uh, technology. On the other hand, the good news is PHP is not the bottleneck. So in most cases, it's not about fixing performance problems in PHP directly. Maybe in the application, but this is a matter of designing the application, then it's not actually PHP that's slow in an application. Well, the thing that we saw out there that's the slowest component most time is the page itself. So uh, and this is not a fake site, actually. This is a, a site that was really once out there uh, online. And uh, actually, uh, it's still available on an archive site. Uh, and when you, when you load it, you find out that the entire site takes more than two minutes to fully render. Uh, well, yeah, overloaded pages. And so if we have that bottleneck in our application, it's no, there's no requirement to do a, a scaling on the server side. So we have probably other things to fix first. We have to prepare for our scaling. So preparing for the scaling process means to break the application really into small components, to have these components where we can find the bottleneck then and start there with proper sizing with scaling. So on the one hand, the front end, 
with the, the browser, the code in the browser, not only the code, but also the design, as we saw before. On the other hand, then on the server side, load balancers, web servers, caching servers, uh, application servers, and the PHP engine in our case, uh, and maybe here not only the application server, but the application itself, breaking it down into smaller pieces in functionality, microservices, uh, and for sure the database, very important, we will hear about that later then, and create an environment with avoiding bottlenecks and also reducing load for certain tiers. Only send load to certain components, that's really requirement, uh, that's really required there. I'll, I'll give you an example. We have a, a web application, we send an initial request to our web server, uh, Apache has mod PHP loaded, and we send back uh, the HTML to the browser, uh, it's rendered there, and in the next step, we send additional requests. Still talking about HTTP 1 here, so a little different than in HTTP 2, but we send new requests to the web server for our images, for our JavaScript, for our style sheets, and for every single request that we send to the web server, we need to start a new process for Apache because it's a new request actually. And even for requests for static content, we have to load all the modules that are defined for Apache here. So we have to load P the PHP engine for our images, for our JavaScript, for our style sheets. And that's actually creating load on the server that's not really necessary there. It overloads the server that could be done differently. Well, you might say, uh, well, yes, that the content uh, we can use, we, we have that in the cache anyway, if it's designed uh, properly. Yes, that's true. But note that cached content, like here in a, in a Magento environment, we see uh, for the request, we get the three or four not modified. That still creates round trips and requests to the web server. Because on the one hand, we have the uh, caching where the file is stored in the browser and uses an exp expiration date. And after that date, the, the new request is sent to the server again. But uh, a lot of caching logic is based on this conditional caching. So what does it mean? We send, the, the browser sends a request to the web server uh, using a, a hash the, the entity tag for the content of the file. The web server checks whether the file has been changed or not. And if the file is still the same, the web server sends back a 304, only the HTTP header, not an HTTP body. And the, the content itself is taken from the cache in the browser. But we still create requests to the web server. And uh, for here, that means for every single request, even though it's cached, we create a new process for Apache loading the PHP module. So that could be done more efficiently, for instance, by using a technology like uh, Nginx here, and only forwarding requests for PHP engine, for uh, PHP requests to the PHP engine, uh, fast process manager in that case, and all the other requests are served in a very efficient way by the web server here, by Nginx. And in, in the background here, we could even have multiple instances of PHP Fast Process Manager running, depending on the requirement. So if we have a lot of PHP requests or uh, requests that require a lot of processing, and the web server is easily able to handle that, but we need more instances for PHP, we can do that easily in Nginx by defining a load balancer here. We have uh, an upstream, uh, a, a location block for PHP. By the way, who is using Nginx already? Not that many, okay. Uh, 
So for those who are using it, you might already know that uh, feature here for the others. Uh, we define an, an upstream block where we send the request for PHP by fast CGI. And in the upstream block, we can define multiple servers. And that creates a, a load balancer for us out of the box. That's a very cool feature here. So uh, what we have done here is we have a web server and we have already a, a scaled environment. We have multiple PHP worker processes running here. And we don't need multiple web servers uh, just because of like Apache is doing it. We have the module to be loaded in the web server. Okay, so we have, we have an application now. Uh, we, we have the web server, we have uh, the application server, we have multiple instances running here. But is there maybe a requirement to optimize our application first? Because uh, there is this philosophy that I've heard a lot of times uh, for developers don't focus on performance, uh, focus on functionality. Performance can be optimized, can be tuned later on. But I don't agree with that. I always, I'm a fan of doing my homework first and doing my work properly and then uh, trying to see what we can maybe improve more. Uh, a good example or a good comparison that I always like to uh, do here is the with, with mice. So imagine we have a house, we have a lot of mice, and the requirement is we have to catch more mice because our mouse catching performance is not good enough. Well, uh, given situation is so far we got two cats, cat one, cat two, and uh, in that example if we plan to scale our environment horizontally here and we get 10 of these cats, I think we are still not able to catch uh, a single mouse here. So first task before scaling is optimize the cat. Make sure the cat is really able to catch your mouse efficiently and scale that cat. But uh, Focus always on what's needed. Don't don't over op don't over optimize. So really, <coughs> focus on on what's required. And the the eighty twenty rule I think is really a good rule here. So uh, twenty percent of efforts can solve eighty percent of the problems, and I think that's a good balance here. Uh, a couple of examples uh, that we had uh, with. Uh, where we saw that where people tried to solve problems just by scaling without optimizing their code first is uh, we had a performance bottleneck in a PHP application, in a PHP environment, where we saw that most of the time really was spent here in the PHP tier. Uh, by analyzing that in detail, we identified three major bottlenecks. On the one hand, there was a less uh, CCSS preprocessor. On the other hand, a social login module and slow PHP execution because of a lot of compilation time. It's not that long ago. It's two years ago, but they were still using PHP uh, 5.3. And so this was very easy uh, sorted out. Uh, they just uh, updated to uh, 5.6 and uh, the, the compilation problem was not there anymore. And even the other two problems uh, were found pretty easy. So on the one hand, most of the time of the response time was definitely spent in these less C uh, uh, library. They did not recognize that before because they just installed it and, and hoped that it would solve their problems. Uh, with uh, style sheets. So less C is a, is a style sheet uh, preprocessor. But the problem was they were using it in production environment, but in the development mode. So development mode means they always uh, 
reprocessed the, uh, the source files, which for sure caused a lot of uh, response time. Uh, and the other problem was with the, the social uh, login module, they had external calls to uh, social platforms that were not even activated in their environment. This was a bug with that module. Uh, after that was fixed, uh, actually most of the performance problems were already sorted out. And without doing that, we, they would have created a, a horizontally scaled environment with that bottlenecks in, but nothing would have become faster. And yeah, this is the, the third example with the compilation time for a PHP. So in the end, uh, what they did after that, uh, by the way, uh, an online shop, uh, Magento online shop, they had this small environment and uh, horizontally scaled uh, in AWS by using a load balancer here. The cool thing is, uh, in, in such an environment, you don't need to create a, a static uh, deployment here, uh, but you can really react on, on requirements. Uh, deployments are no longer static. Traffic can be low in the morning, can be high in the evening, can be uh, in a different region during the night, so you could uh, start uh, or, or shut down instances, move uh, instances to new other availability zones that can be done very flexible in, in AWS. Uh, on the one hand, by integrating uh, metrics directly from AWS, but you have also very cool features to create your own scripts and use metrics from other monitoring tools where you measure response times, for instance, or uh, request rates and upsize or downsize your, uh, your environment in AWS. That's what they did. So they had an ins uh, a sizing of 10 uh, instances for PHP. So a web server here, then PHP instances, some databases in the background. And after uh, it was last year in, in the peak season for before Christmas, and they started a marketing campaign and upsized their environment, and started. Uh, we 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 had a screenshot here where they ran 48 instances, and in the in the beginning everything seemed to be pretty okay. A lot of instances, traffic increased, and then crash again. But what we saw is it was not PHP anymore, but the problem was the database. So what happened? On the one hand, we saw that for one single web request, we had around 4,000 database statements. And actually, that's not the worst number I've seen here. We had examples with 20, 30,000 database requests for one single web request. So where did they come from? Uh, on the one hand, we talked about that earlier. The uh, entity attribute value system of, of Magento that creates a lot of requests in the background where we, when we access one single product. On the other hand, we saw that the, the slow statements actually came from from uh, a different library with that was used within Magento, and this was the Minify CSS library. We had insert statements here that took 30 seconds and more, uh, which makes obvious why single web requests crashed at all or, or, and the system was not usable anymore. The problem actually was that in their environment, when they had here the load balancer and all the PHP instances running, they forgot about a database in the background. The database was still designed for the 10 instances. Now they had 
50 instances, a lot of requests sent to the database, overloaded database, connections became slow, statements became slow. Uh, then with the uh, update and, and insert logic in the Minify CSS library, they had table logs. And in the end, the entire system was not accessible anymore. So for database access, it's very important to size the database too. Not for the, for, the, for the standard environment really, but, but for the peak. The database has to serve all the requests. On the other hand, uh, to reduce connections and use, reduce SQL statements, in the example with the Minify CSS, so what they wanted to, uh, the, the goal that they had with the Minify CSS was for sure to speed up the front end. Well, front end uh, got a little bit faster, but the back, back end became much slower. So uh, actually, uh, cost and, and, and revenue was not uh, well balanced here. Just by reducing that Minify CSS library, uh, the number of SQL statements um, got down to almost half the value of before, uh, and the system worked again. And especially for databases, use caching. A couple of words on caching. Caching is not equal caching, right? We already talked about client-side caching a little bit with the uh, web requests that are still sent to the web server. Uh, now a little bit on server-side caching. Well, server-side caching itself would be a topic for 10 talks. So I focus just on one aspect here, and this is using memcached in a, in a PHP environment. The requirement that I had is, uh, is coming from, from a mapping application. So we have an application, a uh, geographical information system that's using uh, open maps and displays certain data on the map, uh, certain uh, locations, certain distributions of uh, geographical data. And in the original version, actually all of that data was processed directly from the source data, from survey data, land survey, and displayed here on the map. Well, that's very time intensive to create that data out of the box always. On the other hand, it's not really necessary because on the one hand, we have the source data. On the other hand, they are not changing regularly. So when we pre-process that and store it and make the pre-processed data available for the, for the front end, that would speed up everything significantly. And we did that with memcached. So we had a process, uh, a, a batch process running in the background that created a, a, a GeoJSON file for the, the relevant data and stored that already with a given access key, the, the, the key for the URL that's used uh, by the web request then, and used that to store it in a memcache server. So uh, this was not done in a web request. This was really done in a background job. And the logic to retrieve the data can be done in Nginx directly. We don't even need, don't even need PHP code for that. So we define a location block for our get geojson and forward the request, similar to what we did before, where we forwarded the request to the PHP engine, we forward the request to the memcached server. As a fallback here, if we don't find uh, an entry for that key, we can always forward the request to PHP to get a, a on the fly uh, processing for that data. But in general, that should not be necessary. So 
This can be done by Nginx directly. We don't even need PHP code for that. And actually, when we did that, uh, uh, even maybe before most of us uh, knew about the term, we already created our first microservice architecture. So we really split off existing functionality from the big application and created uh, a certain service for certain functionality. And in that case, if we have split this functionality in smaller services, it's always easy to scale where it's important. If we have a slow service, we can work there. We don't need to touch the other thing. <coughs> if we have such a large environment with browsers, caching layers, web servers, applications, databases, uh, there are a lot of tools out there where we can do uh, proper monitoring. It's especially in terms of performance very important that we also monitor that because we need to find out where it's slow to be able to react on, on the slow parts. Uh, the problem with uh, a lot of tools out there is if they are just in the browser, just caching, monitoring, just web server, just PHP, is that we cannot bring everything in a, in a complete picture. And this is uh, where application performance management uh, finds its role. Uh, with application performance management, we really start at the user to see what the user is doing and already show uh, is the user satisfied or frustrated or is, it to is it the user tolerating the request by considering response times, by considering uh, errors that we get. And from the user, we start following what is the user doing, what is the user doing in the browser, what is the response time for a certain user action in the browser, uh, and what does this finally trigger on the web server or in the application. So for instance, a certain click in on a certain button in the browser causes this database statement, causes that exception. Uh, on the web server. Uh, not only uh, seeing what the code is doing, but also uh, we are finding out how processes are performing, how the web server is doing, how a PHP engine is doing, how load balancers are, are performing, what, what is the database doing, and not only technical aspects, but also business relevant aspects. So for instance, uh, some examples here from, from Magento dashboards, it's then very easy to bring revenues, to bring uh, conversion rates in direct uh, conjunction with performance, with response times, with errors. So if I have certain errors in a certain browser or on a mobile device, does this directly affect my revenue, my conversion rate. Um, yeah, well, that's it from my side. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? version for, for developers, so no cost at all. Uh, it's, yeah, you, you can find a link here if you want to try it. Here on, on my last uh, page of the slides, just download it, install it. As I said, free for developers, free for lifetime, not only for Android. And for uh, the user experience, because I know you already. Uh, yes, uh, I mean, uh, New Relic is one of our main competitors in the APM world. Uh, just uh, a couple of words maybe on the main difference is uh, that especially for developers, we have the benefit that we are not doing snapshots, but we are capturing all transactions. So there's nothing you would miss 
you would see every transaction and uh, really from, from the click in the browser down to the database, we in the newest version we even have an extension here uh, to go into the database and show the execution plan for, uh, for the SQL statement and also go down on code level. Uh, On, on the certain tiers in the application? Yes, yes. Uh, it's an agent-based technology, so uh, for instance, for uh, PHP, it's an extension that you load into the PHP engine, and then we can uh, trace what the execution is doing there. That's different from technology to technology. So for, for Apache, it's a module. For, for Nginx, it's also a, a dynamic module that we load even in Nginx version that do not support dynamic modules, but we found a solution for that. Uh, yeah. Right, so you've got more questions for Harold. You can ask him later. Yes. <laughs> I believe. Yes. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Uh, and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so the last speaker for the night. Oh, yeah. Let's take this.